Dr. Ben. Rock and roll. Let's go. <laughs> I love being spontaneous. And I love that you're allowing to go spontaneous. Yeah. So you're like very easy going. Were I, you always like that? I don't know. I, I'm just not a planner, honestly. I don't like, you know, if you make a plan uh, for stuff that doesn't really matter, then you have to stick to stuff that doesn't really matter. And I'm like, I just, just roll with it. And so I, I would prefer to do it. Have you ever set any goals? Oh, yeah. I do goals on stuff that matters. Um, but like your daily activities, um, you know, most of that for me is can be filled with lots of stuff that uh, if I plan it, then um, sometimes you miss some of the things that just come your way if you would take advantage of if you just kind of let things roll. How do you define what matters? Um, well, it's really simple for me. That would be, you know, spiritual stuff, family stuff, and, and work stuff are the things that really matter. And my goals would be um, surrounding those three main aspects of my life. And do you but, have, mm -hmm. but mostly, I mean, as I go through my day, like, you know, there's just a lot of things that don't really matter, you know, yeah, like little tasks that just, you shouldn't be bogged down by what, uh, where to get gas or what right. to eat for lunch or yeah. that stuff. Well, if you take a tollway or the freeway, exactly. Right. Doesn't really matter. So yeah, I, it's, it's just a segue, but I live, um, where there's a tollway mm -hmm. and there's a freeway. Yeah. And they're like, sometimes I'm like, like, do I really want to spend a buck 50? <laughs> but then I'm like, is your time worth more? Yeah. Like if you get to a place, even like five minutes faster, yeah. like I get, sometimes it occupies my space in yeah. my, in my head, but it's, it's funny. So I was going to say sometimes uh -huh. it's the, it's not the buck 50. It's the, the fact that you spend 30 seconds thinking about it, you know? Right. It's like, wait, well, that's a waste of time. Right. You know? Yeah. So do you have a day? I'm going to jump into a very specific conversation about this office, but since we started about planning and goal setting, yeah. I'm really curious to have a day that like that you just shut down for a day, you go take a piece of paper, look at the goals from the previous year. How do you do that? Yeah. Usually I do once a year where I do like a main clarity retreat type thing uh -huh. where it becomes a, uh, um, look at all the numbers, see the facts you've got and then see where it's gone. And, um, and then from there, plan plan what's coming up ahead. Uh, I love the. I heard, I heard this quote on, I don't know, some platform recently that said that there's a reason why the the front windshield is bigger than the rearview mirror. So right. like the numbers are good to kind of base it off of, but that's for me is more of a historical. Like if I did the same thing I did last year, then I'm going to get the same results. So how do I move forward? And so for me, my planning sessions are once a year, big ones, and then quarterly when when um when the quarter's done, then you look through all the numbers that you've done. Um, and then adjust the major plans, um, from there. Um, I, I stick to five main goals in a year. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not a, you know, 25 goaler guy. That either means some of your goals are too weak or, or there's too many of them and you don't do any of them. Or it's, it's just a to-do list. Yeah. It's a checkoff list. Right. Right. And, um, I don't know. Goals for me are, are more like uh, checkpoints than they are goals. Like I don't, I don't have a goal to reach a number because then when you reach a number, then there's a, there could be a let, you know, a period of just not pushing anymore because you've reached your goal. So it's more of a checkpoint for me when I do my retreats for business, family stuff and spiritual stuff is different because that's obviously different types of goals. A lot of those right. are more time oriented than, than, uh, um, you know, work focused or things like that, but uh, got it. Yeah. What are, what are the categories? Like, I don't want to ask you specific goals. That's too personal, but yeah. you said five main goals. Like, can you walk us through the categories and what would that look like? Like if I accomplish X, then do this or like the numbers yeah. or something. So I, I use it like a, it sounds weird, but I use it like a debt reduction program Okay. where, um, you know, my three focuses of family, faith and work are uh are never going to be really be in balance like that term is a weird term for me because sometimes you need more time into work sometimes you need more time in the family sometimes you need more time into your spiritual stuff and the balance just doesn't work like you you know you have to roll with it and figure out where 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 you need to put more time and allocate your resources towards in order to make that goal work and so for me if i set a goal and so my five main goals will always have at least one of those five will be one of those three no matter what um, but if I hit a checkpoint in that goal process on a work thing, then I can reassess and reallocate some of my time to the other four. 
and get that to a checkpoint. And then when, you know, three of the five are there, then I can reallocate time to be like, okay, now I'm going to be, uh, you know, a lot of times I, in the past I'd set goals and then have the goals be accomplished and be like, okay, great. And then, and then I watch more TV or I do stuff that doesn't help at all. You watch TV? You know, I have, I have a certain number of shows I like to watch, you know? Okay. And so, but usually I'll like binge watch some yeah. season of Survivor or something that is just a mindless entertainment. Yeah. Um, whereas recently I've been trying to just, you know, in a debt reduction program, you're like, okay, I have $10,000 of debt. I paid off of, I made monthly payments. Now I only have 2000, but you still make the same payments for the 2000 that you made for the 10,000 to pay it off real quick. And same thing with my goals. I'm just allocating time towards those. So as you get towards the end of the year, hopefully you hit your checkpoints in the last two much quicker because you're allocating so much more time to those than you did the first the in the first, first quarter than the last quarter. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So you would, for example, you would be, does it resonate with you when let's just say you're like, okay, I have five practices. I really need to get one off the ground. Yeah. And that means I'm going to spend X amount of money, X amount of time. That means my family will take a little bit less this year, like maybe less trips. And then some of the other stuff would be less because I need to get this done this year. For sure. And then the following year, we're planning like six or seven trips or like this and that. Is that, does that sound right? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't really have goals for trips or even personal income. I don't, I don't really set goals for stuff like that, but, but the way it would work. So like for this practice that we started, you know, it's a longer drive for me. Um, it required a lot more upfront capital, um, that I've never really done for the other offices. Like usually yeah, the other ones I would take loans out on, on, but, um, but because it's starting out, it requires more time for me. And so I would, I'm putting more time and effort into it than I, than I have the other practices. So they adjust as I grow this. And then when this grows then I can then reallocate that time to something else that, that is more important. But as far as like family vacations and stuff, like, you know, I mean, this sounds really simple, but like we have certain, um, family commitments or covenants we've made where we're going to, we're going to for sure go on these vacations and do these things. And those are, those are, you know, unless something's really going bad at work, those are things that we always do because that's what our kids, that's where they are in the priority of, of what we're trying to do. Right. And that's also part of our, the family portion of one of our goals. So, yeah. Cause you only get 18 summers. Yeah. I mean, more, if you have more kids, Tiger, you know, you, right. you get more than 18, but I, you know, our oldest, our oldest last summer was two years ago and our youngest has, she's going to be 13. So we have, you know, five, six more summers with yeah. our kids still in school. And then it's, and which is weird, but, but then it's onto that new, onto that new life, uh, life plan. Yeah. But so do you just a Promise. I love, I just love thinking about this. Like, um, have you thought about what you're going to do after the kids are out of the house? No, no. Mm -mm. Okay. And you're I still going to keep the house, right? Yeah, for okay. sure. I think the, I mean, the house stuff is, I mean, I, I grew up in a family where my parents still live in the same house that I was raised in. And, and so like, there's part of that, that, that brings home, a remember all these stories and I want that for my kids and the house that we have now is far too large for just M and I, but hopefully it won't just be M and I all the time. It'll be M and I and our children and their children that come for right. For me. And it would be worth it to yeah. even have it for like a like two, three, four holidays or get-togethers per year. Absolutely, yeah. You know, and if you, I mean, if you own your house, then and there's not a payment on it, then that makes it. Even though in Texas, you know how it is. There's, our taxes each year, right. our mortgage payments right. in some places, but, um, no, but the, uh, we, we keep the house, keep everything and just keep going. Awesome. Well, let's dive in into this practice. So yeah. like when I, I saw you this morning and then I drove to go get all the equipment and I'm driving back, I'm like, how would I title this? And it seems like <laughs> maybe it's just too cheesy, but it seems like a title for this practice is yeah. like, like a one point. Eight million dollar practice for two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, it's got the, I mean, the demographics work really well in this area, and um, and there is the challenge part of it. Like, I've never started up a practice. The the other practices I that I have, I bought those practices with current patients. With person, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and so there's a challenge of like, well, I've I've been able to grow all those practices. What could I do with a brand new practice? And if the practice can. 
um, sustain the first period of like really slowness, then you get to the point where the value of that practice is great. And you take a practice that you buy for 200 and have it valued within a year or two at a million. Like that's a, that's a good return on, on my investment. Um, not that I would necessarily want to sell it, but there is part of that, that for sure. I think the, the upside is, is, uh, is really, really great. And yeah. it's, it's a challenge, which also is, is fun. Correct. So this is the practice number five, right? Practice in number four. Four. Mm -hmm. So you have one in uh, Bellmeet uh, Temple, mm -hmm. and then there's one more. Gatesville. Gatesville. Gatesville one, yeah. So this is Round Rock, closer yeah. to the, the Austin area. Yeah. So early again today, I made a comment that it's like everything was smooth sailing with the three other. Yeah. And then you bought this one and it's just like a big challenge now and it's, you know, you, you're putting in the money. But then I was thinking about it, like maybe intentionally, unintentionally, you are looking for challenges. Like, do you have a checkbox to check in, in your professional career to say, I've done it all sort of thing? Like, no, there are no checkboxes for that. But there is a, I mean, my wife and I, um, after I was, after I'd purchased a third practice, um, she had a, request that I wait about five years before I jump into something else. And, um, and so, uh, I, um, I obliged her on that request. And, um, at the five year mark, I started looking again. And so this is where this came about. I have a lot of questions. Yeah. You know, this, um, like since I got married and I have a kid, a lot of my questions are tailored towards the dynamics of the couples. Yeah. Like, I feel like this is, the one thing in anybody's life that can either propel things yeah. or like destroy things. Yeah. And I, and I'm always curious how the conversation is. So like, for example, five years ago when she like asked you not to do anything, like how did that conversation go? Like, can, do you remember, can you walk us through the details? Like, was it a kitchen table? No, no, it was a, it was a evening in bed. Okay. Like to, just sitting up in bed talking about things. And, you know, at that time, you know, I, I bit off a lot at that time, you know, I was still, at that time I still had school debt. And so we were paying a good chunk of money towards that. Um, you know, as anyone knows, when you're trying to grow a practice, it just requires a lot of capital. And so, you know, I'd have my bi-monthly freak out sessions with payroll, which was the biggest expense and still is in any of these dental practices. But, um, as things would get tight, um, then, you know, I'd have, you know, I, I think for me, I guess I'd preface this by saying, you know, as the years go by, you're able to handle more and more weight on your shoulder, you know, with any profession or business and going, coming out and being out of school four or five years, being able to take the weight and the load of a, of a debt and the stress of how things are going to be paid. I wasn't as capable then as I am now. So now things just are easier. They roll off better. I like, there's not the, the same stress that I used to have. There's more cash flow too, which always helps. But, um, so we were sitting down one night and we could tell it was the day before payroll would run. And, uh, um, we were good in two of the offices, but the one we just purchased is purchased and we purchased some, some um, team members that were more expensive than, than what I would have preferred. And so their payroll was, it was really tight and I was having to borrow money from my personal accounts to help cover that. And, um, no one likes to do that, you know, but you do what you have to do. And, and so, um, she could tell I was in a stressful, um, state and she said, can we talk about what's going on? And then that's how that started. And she just said, I, I, I'd like you to, um, take these practices that are in winter right now and get them in summer. So you've got cash flow and you're good to go before we, before we extend out and do more. And, um, she arbitrarily said five years and, um, and I'm like, okay, I can do that. And so that's what I've been doing for the last you know, that was six years ago now, but, um, so they just got paused and there wasn't any, I mean, I didn't feel sad. I didn't feel like she, it was a high priority to her. Right. And for me, I was like, I was stressed with what you had the max the anyways. Yeah. I'm like, okay, well this might be just all I want anyways. And then, um, as those stabilized and it got, got a better handle on it. And as I was able to bear more of the stresses of just running a practice and the, and the financials and payroll and team members of all that, then, um, I realized I wanted more. Okay. Can you walk us through this purchase? Like what were the numbers? If you can share. Yeah, you bet. What, how did you evaluate it? 
And then we'll talk about this, some of the positive surprises at the end. Yeah. So we were, um, I was looking for practices and I, I had gone down a couple of different routes. I'm like, I looked for practices to buy. I looked for practices to, uh, um, build, um, from the ground up with real estate included. And I looked for existing practices and, um, we had been to a couple of different sites, uh, places that we were looking to purchase. Um, and I mean, we're talking, this is 2000. 20 early 2023 middle 2023 so real estate in this area um wasn't cheap and it's still not cheap but it, it, at that time it, it really it really hit a hit a peak and so um starting a practice in the area we wanted to start with with the build-up and the real estate would be probably a uh, 1.5 million ish um for a four or five pra pra uh, operatory practice with zero patients and I was like, Ooh, that's, I mean, that, that, that jumps right wow. back into the stressful things of like, if you want the real estate, which I'm a big real estate fan, um, then you're, you're well over a million in this area for, for all that, um, with no patience. Um, so a couple options came up with people who were selling their practices as well. Um, but they were practices that, uh, you know, buying a practice that's, that's for sale is great for lots of reasons, patients, cash flow, but there's also bad for reasons that some people don't think about. You're buying their team and all the problems that come with the team, whether they're trained or not trained or whether they're high pay that they shouldn't be high pay or whether they're, um, they have inner team conflicts. You're buying all that. Um, and then you're also buying, um, the procedures that have been done in there for at least a few months. So like, um, you're buying the doctor's work. Right. And so there's, there's complications with that because there's, there's some months there where you're, you're frustrated with the team that's there. Um, but you can't just like, sometimes you can't go in and just clean house all of them because then if you're saying, if you're in an area that you want to grow a practice and that, and those team members live in that area, then you just made 10 enemies of, of, of right. residents in that right. area or more. Um, so buying a practice has its caveats too. Um, this practice, I, I was on a, um, just an email chain and I got an email one day about this practice in Austin that was, um, it was marketed as like a pseudo startup, like it had all the equipment. It'd be great to come in for a new grad to start it up and build it up. And it had a list price of 200,000. And I was like, man, that's really cheap for, for the equipment and for the location. Um, I don't know the real estate, but, the you know, a normal size lease. I'm like, that's a, that's an easy in without a lot of investment to you as you build it up. So I came and saw it and it was well over, uh, the build out alone would have been, um, on a place like this would have been probably four, 400 plus. And that's without the equipment. And so I saw all that and I'm like, well, this is a no brainer, $200,000. I could pay cash for that and then have a practice that would be, um, ready to grow without the high overhead of it which yeah. is the main, main component. The main reason why I like this, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to start a practice out with a $10,000 per month debt for a practice loan and equipment on all, all that combined with no patients. That just didn't seem, seem like my cup of tea. So that's how this kind of fell. I came and saw it and I loved it and made an offer that day and paid cash for it a couple weeks later. Wow. So why do you think other people missed it? Well, they didn't, there was other buyers the same time they listed it. Um, I, uh, there was two other buyers that, that, that low balled the offer. So the one came in at 175, one came in at 190. And, uh, and I was like, I was like, I, I didn't know that. I just, when I saw it, my, uh, I didn't have a agent or anything like that. It was just me and the, the company that owned it. And so when I talked to him, I just felt like I'm, this is already such a great deal. Like I'm not going to come in at a, at a low ball offer. Like I take this, I would take the same practice for 300. And so I just said 200 straight up. And the next day he accepted it and told me about the other two. And I was like, oof, I'm glad I didn't low ball that. That wouldn't, wow. have, wouldn't have been smart. So, wow. Yeah. So the common sense or the business people would probably teach you to say always low ball. You know, all these real estate books from like yeah. Robert Kiyosaki and all these yeah. people and they're like, always give 50% offers. Yeah. You would totally miss this one. Yeah. I mean, I, for me, it wasn't the, it was just what, what it was worth versus what I was paying for it. And I'm like, you know, in any, any transaction that, that is good, that both parties leave happy with, 
um, they both feel like they're getting a good deal. And if I'm paying what they're asking for, then I assume they they feel like they're getting a good deal. And I knew I was getting a good deal based on what it would have cost to build the same thing in the same area. Um, cause it would have been, you know, five to eight times more expensive to do it by myself. And so 200 was, wow, 200 was easy. It wasn't, wow. it wasn't even a question. And I, I didn't want to lose out on, on the practice because of $15,000. Yeah. And so, I mean, obviously there's to you, it seems, it sounds simple, but I feel like a lot of people miss on those opportunities in just simply because they don't move fast enough. They yeah. don't make decisions fast enough. Um, obviously low bowling, the, the already great offer, like not being able to see what you're getting Yeah. and actually in your head, like you said, you think that it should be 300 at 200, you're already getting a good deal Yeah. where other people like, well, you know, there's, their starting point is this 200. Your starting point was 300. Yeah. Well, right. And more, right. Like I, I did, I did, I did act fast, but I take, I take the, the time of looking at other practices and looking at opportunities of building or buying other practices as part of the decision. I, I can make decisions really quickly, but a lot of times people say, oh, you make decisions so fast, but they don't take into account the three or four or five months of all the stuff up to that, that let me know 200 is a great deal. There's no need to, to think about that. Like if yeah. I, if this is part of my plan and part of a goal, then I, there's no need to think I'll, I'll pay you right now. You know? Yeah. If you would put, like, if you would pull out a calculator and try to evaluate this practice right now. And hopefully it's just you and I, nobody hears this. For like, sure. What number would you put? Like all the equipment, the so, build out and all that. Oh, I mean, you had the build out into this. I mean, you're, you're in it 700 probably. Six, Plus the equipment. In, including the equipment probably. 600, six, 700,000. Okay. So like it would be the, the vanilla box mm -hmm. and then you do the build out yep. with all these fancy moldings like yep. the Italian yep. mahogany style. Yep. Which is totally your design style, right? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, his loss is my gain because, you know, he, he put a lot into this practice. And um, and so I'll take it at a price that right. is great. And just for the clarity, and, and I think I will go back to that. So you purchased it from the corporate, not from the doctor. So the doctor sold to the corporate and yep. then you bought it back from the corporate, yep. which is a whole story in its own. Yep. But so what would you say like, if you put a dollar amount on this right now, if I were yeah. to come in and buy it yeah, or build it and like then build it, it. Yeah. Put all the equipment yeah, and stuff. I'd say six fifty, six hundred fifty thousand. Okay. Probably. I was like thinking more like a mill. No, I mean, I mean, it doesn't include the real estate. Like I'd be in the millions for sure if I owned the real estate, but just through the build out on any retail space, you'd be for something like this, you'd probably be in it 400. What's four, the square footage? Uh, 22, 2200. So this build out probably costed them about three hundred dollars, four hundred dollars a square foot. Oof, um, I had to do the math, but it it's was three hundred dollars. So that roughly is six hundred sixty thousand dollars. Yeah, just the build out. I mean, you, I, you're well over five hundred. I would, I would probably guess on the build out for something like this. Yeah. Um, and then uh, supplies. I mean, they're older supply. If I were to do everything new, like he has it, yeah, I'd be in, I'd be in the three fifty range. For, uh, so I guess the seven, six, six fifty seven is not right, but I'd be in the three fifty range for the equipment. Um, because it's all ADEC, right? Equipment is ADEC, the chairs? Yeah. Yeah, it's all nice upgraded stuff. And then you add in the You probably don't even have that in your other offices. Um, I do. And you have ADEX? No, we have Midmark, Midmark chairs and cabinetry in the other offices. So let's just say six fifty for simple math build out. Yeah. Because we see the finishes. Just the, the I forgot what they call the baseboards. Yeah. I remember my construction days, these baseboards are expensive. Yeah. But besides the point three fifty ADEC, about a hundred thousand Sarek machine that that yeah. was accidentally well, included in the deal. Well, a used one. So a new one. We bought a Sarek machine for one of our other offices and it was I mean it was about around two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. And that's not brand new, but um, if we were to replace it, you would replace it with one that was 200,000. Mm -hmm. So 50, 700, I'm already at 1.1. 1 .1. Yeah. When you include all the stuff that comes with it, if I were to strip the practice right now and just take everything out, um, we'd probably be, cause it's used. Of course, we'd probably be in the 250 range. So I knew that going in, I'm like, well, I, there's no real risk here. I could buy it for 200,000. And still use all the parts and get more than 200,000 out of it. Right. Which I didn't want to obviously do, but 
the risk reward was like so extreme and the risk being so low and the reward being so high. Um, so at the high end, I've got a, I've got a risk of losing $200,000 and getting back $200,000 ish or using those, those things in the other practices that would need them at some point anyways. And so there's, there's opportunity there, but the reward of it on the other end could be, you have a practice that's $2.5 million that's worth with the bulk of the other practices. Honestly, if you hook them all together, it could be worth more than 2 million. You bought it for 200,000. Yeah. And it's a no brainer. So if I title this 1.1, Sure. For 200K. So that's that, Sounds great. Would that be yeah. accurate? Okay, cool. We could, we could do a conference and invite people to, you know, say you never want to work again. Right. Exactly. Let me ask you this. So if, if Ben Johnson fresh off the school would be looking at this or would Ben Johnson, Dr. Ben Johnson out of the dental school would even be looking at this? Like, would you be in those emails? at that point when you graduate. So the point that I'm trying to make is if somebody who is just off the dental assisting school looks at this and says, this is no brainer. Like I would have done that too. I'm trying to see if you were in the same position when you graduated or it took you years to build up that business acumen and ability to act fast and ability to evaluate these things faster. Like, yeah, I hope it makes sense. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know how to totally answer that question. I don't think that, because the decisions that you make on a day in day basis definitely are a cumulative effect of everything you've learned through the years and what you can do with the practice. And so I think coming out of school for me would have been more about the confidence issue than it would be about looking at the numbers and saying, Oh, this is a much, this is a good deal. Anyone not even in the dental field could look at this and be like, wait, those things, that seems like that's worth a lot more than what he's paying for it. That part was easy. It was the part of assuming, um, the the monthly expenses that would come with it um, once you bought it that would be the the part that would have been harder to swallow for me just because yeah. of the confidence issue like starting up a practice in school um, everyone knows that it's slow cash flow is a big issue and and external money into it a bit into a business is required in order for it to to flow until you can get enough patients to right. see things and so um, and the debt is the big issue too. Yeah. And again, yeah, you got school debt as well that right. comes into that. And so like, um, you know, once that debt is paid, like, you know, when associates work for me, I make, and usually they're, they're usually younger, um, um, a couple of years out of school and I make sure they're aware that their expectations shouldn't be that they're going to make what I make or what the normal quote unquote dentist makes in the first 10 years. Like it's 10 years of like survival. Um, because you've got, if you start as an associate, as an associate or as an owner, really like honestly, cause as an owner, you still have survival because you've got to get a practice to the point where you, it runs the way that it needs to run to be profitable. That doesn't necessarily take 10 years, but you're still adding on to that, the debt that goes with that. So you have a practice debt that's big. Um, you have your school debt that's big. You have the, you know, the, the misguided expectations of spouses sometimes about what it should be like after dental school, you know, it's a big and, one. And so I, I make sure the associates know, just don't be, don't be concerned about living like a normal person, quote unquote, in a normal house, moderate house, at least for the first 10 years out of, out of school. Um, which is what we did. we lived in just a little normal house. It, it cost us two fifty in 2009 and uh, it was a great house. We had it for 10 years. At 10 years, this, this, the debt on the practices was gone and the debt on our school was gone. Student loans. So we had a ton of like extra income that was coming in. So then we bought a much bigger house and in 2019, which was a perfect timing. <laughs> right. Then everything freaking doubled, you know, in the next yeah. two years. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm happy that we did what we did there. But um, it's important that, that doctors know that that 10 year period is a normal growing pains of being able to manage the stress of what comes after that time Tim, right. in your period from what you've seen do you think it's better for a dentist in that 10 year period after graduating to be an associate or to be a business owner no i think if you have the ability to do it you should own like I, it just owning changes everything like it changes the the dynamic of um building something up um and at least for me, I guess I'd answer this question in, in one way. I'd say if you're worried about cash flow, great, be an associate. If you're worried about net worth, own. 
because cash flow, you can make a lot of money. As if I was a, if I was an associate right now, I would make a ton of money because I, I, like any dentist who has experience and and is confident in what they do, like they can, you can produce, you can make a lot of money, but your net worth is only tied to that W two. That's it. But if you own now, now it's a net worth game, not a cash flow game. And so, like you make decisions based on how does this affect my net worth, not how does it, how does this affect my cash flow. I would never buy this practice if all, all I was worried about was cash flow. Because I'm like, that's two hundred thousand dollars I had in an account. Like, well, I, I would take that as as a negative cash flow, you know, um, transaction for me. But because it's not about cash flow, it's about net worth. Then I buy a practice, and my potential is to add two million to my net worth. Like that becomes a no brainer. So it, right. out of school or not, if you, if you're two years out of school and you, you're worried about net worth, ownership is the way to go. Because I work in a practice, I get $2 million. I take home $350,000. That's great and fine and everything. But if the practice started at a million and I take it at 2 million, now I've added a million dollars ish of net worth onto my, onto my name. And so that's the part that a lot of new new grads don't even consider the the consideration of like it's not about cash flow it's never about cash flow it's about net worth if you've got the cash to cover things that's great but like all the real estate that i bought all the things we have is in an effort to keep my cash flow tight because if it's not tight then i don't feel the need to like work it's like if i have four thousand right. in an account i'm like well i don't really have to do this implant this patient's annoying why would I, I don't want to do that but right if I know cash flow is tight, but my net worth game is, is on point, then, then it forces me to go to work and to be like, I'm here, I'm going to, I'm going to make this worthwhile. And so that's my, uh, my very long answer about new associate owning or not, um, cash flow or net worth. What do you want? I'm writing it down. I, I want to make sure I don't miss it. Cash flow or net worth. Yeah, I have a, a dentist, uh, one of the dentists in when in our Waco practice, he bought in recently to the Waco practice and great dentist, great guy. Um, he made it off comments uh, last month about, um, you know, he's an owner now. And he's like, man, I, I feel like I'm getting paid the same. And it kind of struck me a little weird. I'm like, well, you know, I, I took I took a day and thought about it. And I, I had my uh, one of our business people run the numbers to see what it was. And he was getting paid a couple thousand more um, per month. Um, and so it was pretty close, but what he wasn't considering is every month he made a payment to, to, and I financed it, I financed him. And so he would make a payment of, you know, $7,000 a month that would go to me. And, you know, you know, 6,000 of that was, was principal. And I sat him down and I said, you understand that you're yeah, great. You're making the same amount, but every month you're adding $6,000 onto your net worth. Like you, you, this has to be a consideration for you. If it's not, then you're thinking, why would I own? I'm doing the same thing. I, I have more responsibilities. I, I'm taking more things on, but I'm getting paid the same. And I'm like, no, you're, you're not. I mean, just in the numbers wise, you've got, you, you know, you bought in six months ago, you've got six, six, you got $36,000 of net worth you've added onto your portfolio. And if you don't track it, then in moments of tight cash flow, you make stupid decisions because right. you're like, man, this is not worth it. I'm making less money than I was before. And survive yeah. survive with cash flow but live with your net worth yeah i think a lot of people going back to where we started i think a lot of people are under that pressure because they don't have the support at home absolutely yeah that's i mean the hardest thing well and i that i think that's an excellent point because because your spouses for the most part only see cash flow they know what's in the account and that's how they determine what they spend or potential for cash flow right and so like, uh, when you have net worth plays that are scary or that you're unloading a lot of money into things that, that have big dividends in the future, that's hard for them to see because all they know is, well, we used to have X amount of dollars in the account. Now we have X amount of dollars minus whatever. And so right. it causes stress. And then there's the, the back and forth of trying to convince your spouse why this is a good play. Right. And, and then downsizing if needed or making yeah. some decisions to cut. Yeah, for sure. I mean, my, uh. My wife's amazing. She she's incredibly just intelligent. Just met her today. Yeah, she's 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 great. And uh, but she also compliments me very well. Like she's not like me in most ways. Um, she's not spontaneous. She doesn't like risks. She doesn't. She's very time oriented. So all these things that she's she would view as different from me, we use as just 
as just pieces to make our puzzle better. Like she's really, really good at, at, at complimenting the things I do well at, but there, you know, we had a, she had a car that was, uh, I don't know, it was worth like 50,000 and a, uh, an opportunity came up for us to put money into something. And, um, we ended up taking money from her car. Like we sold her car and took that money, and invested it into something that was a good, um, long-term play for us. And so I'm really blessed to be able to have a wife that, that understands that and is willing to give up something that she wants right now for something that will pay back long-term. Right. And, right. It's, and it's really hard. And I realize that I'm, I'm lucky with that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's so cool. Um, so what do you want for this practice? Like when you drive here for about an hour and a half yeah, from Waco to Brown Rock, Texas, yeah. and you walk into this practice and probably what people don't understand is, you know, when you buy f for 200,000 a practice, whatever the cost could be, but you're not buying where it's at today. Like I think for people like you and I consider myself like similar in that sense is when I look at things, I look at the bigger picture. Yeah. Like when I walk in, I see a ton of people here. I can see a ton of people waiting. I can see full schedule. I can see like different type of procedures. Like what's in your mind when you drive here, like every Friday? Well, the long term for me is like, I see my son working here. Like my, uh, my son's 21 and he, uh, he's on the path for dental school. And, um, so he's got eight, nine years ahead of him still. If everything goes the way he, he plans it and, and those change, but I've got a couple kids who all want to be dentists. And so I want them to have opportunities to walk into something better than I had when I got out of school. And so my long-term plan is I see this practice being in the practice for one of my kids. It's a um, LeBron James move. Yeah. Right. Just, yeah. I mean, really, but that's the thing. Like I, I don't want, I don't want our kids not to have opportunities. And I, yeah. and I'm also not naive to know that a lot of that depends on who they marry and a spouse of one of my kids might be more apt to want to live in the Austin area. They don't want to live in the Waco area for lots of reasons. Um, so they'd have options to do that. And so long term, I see my son or one of my sons or maybe both my sons um, participating in a practice like this. And then the second thing is I, you know, all our practices have a feel to them. Like when I'm when I'm there, my team's there. Patients know we have a good time. There's a lot of laughter. It's just a it's not a normal dental office. Um, and that's what I envision this being a, a place where there's where it's full and we're like in five years, like we got to build our own place because there's just not enough space for what we've got. Um, so that's, that's the long-term plan for me. Do you think you're going to stop by four? No. no, more to come. There's more to come for sure. I don't know if I'll do the same depending on how the next six months go here. Um, I don't know if I'd do a brand new startup, but again, but ask me that in six months, I'll let you know. You know? Yeah. yeah. Another podcast episode. Yeah. Well. See, yeah. see how an update on, yeah. The 200,000 to 2 million practice. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Probably the last question, what, you know, when I saw today was like, I pick, I try to pick up the little things to me. What was like really big deal was that Alice and Megan, they're all here with you. So like yeah. if you would be starting off and even Dan is here, right? So it's like, you, it's not like you're starting from scratch, get your team. Yeah. Right. So like, when I look at my business, I'm like, I got a couple of people on my team that I'm like, you know what? Anything I do in the future, you guys with me. Yeah. Right. So like, I feel like you brought your A team yeah. to this practice to just. Like, well, and that was the other thing too. The decision to buy this, they were involved in that. Like I knew, I knew that in any business, your job is to sell things. Sometimes those things are you're selling an idea to your employees or your team members, or you're selling something to an actual customer they're going to buy. Um, in this case, I knew I had to sell the idea of a practice that was, um, an hour away, at least for Megan and Allison to get them going. I needed, I know I needed them, their approval because I, they were going to be the ones working here when I was here until it got big enough that we would equip it with its own people. Right. And, um, so that they were involved in that process and they were excited about what, what it could be. Yeah. And, um, that's why they're here. They come down every time I'm here, they, they come down and we just carpool together and all in one car. No, usually the girls go in one car and me and Dan and Emily go in the other car. Okay. But, uh, I could go in all one car, but there, there's some, there's some car sickness issues that they, yeah, yeah. the girls have. So yeah, whatever. I don't really care. Yeah. I wonder what tunes you guys would be putting in like 
I oh. want you guys to be listening if you're all I, in the same car. When I drive, I'm a quiet. I don't like anything. I just like my own thoughts. And so um, when Dan and I come together, um, a lot of times it's just quiet. Like I just, I, yeah. I'm just in my own running through, running through things of the day and running through what's coming up and what opportunities there are. And yeah, you know, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a boring car guy. It's like occasionally I'll, I'll pop in a, comedy sketch or something like that just to make me laugh you know I, I i i really enjoy those but um for the most part it's a it's a quiet my wife on the other hand is a crank it up she loves country music and she'll crank it up and then i'll turn it down <laughs> and she'll put it back in she'll put it back up yeah, yeah. it goes back and forth yeah, yeah. that's yeah. awesome but, it's interesting you say that lately i've been uh, pretty much in the same mind space yeah like it used to be podcasts uh, books and all that on yeah. the drive to the office Last two weeks, it's like, no, I, usually I would just even put up my email, like as, as a drive, just voice type yeah. my thoughts. Yeah. And then when I get to the office, I send it to me and to myself and, yeah. and get to the office, open it up and there will be some one or two things I need to act on. Yeah. But it's really cool. Like what's in your head? I mean, it's funny. I think, I think if you have no experience, the headspace is a scary space because you don't know, you don't have the information to, to solve whatever riddles or puzzles come your way. But as you go through in your particular field, if you've got a lot of experience, like the most valuable resource you have is already in your head. You just have to like have enough quiet time to let it come out. And I think sometimes people rely too much on, oh, I heard a quote here. Or I read a book here. Or, I did this. And in a particular field, if you read a book that's good, usually you, you think it's good because you're like, oh, yeah, I understood all those points and I agree with them, which yeah. means that stuff was already there. You just yeah. have to like let it. Yeah. Let it flow, like give it give it a place to come out and you hear the phrase, Oh, I had come up with one of the best ideas in the shower. And you're like, Well, that's because you shut up in the shower. There's not a TV, there's not a there's not a radio. You're just you and your thoughts. Yeah. And so if you have experience, like just let them let them come out. Like they're there and Yeah. And we already pre programmed it. We've heard it all before. Yeah, especially if you've been in the field for ten plus years, you know. Yeah. You know what's there. And um at least that's why I tell myself or why I drive with nothing in the car. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, I can't, I mean, obviously there, I can't say that every time it's quiet, I'm, I'm a, an effective thinker, but there are times where things come and I'm like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense or things like that. Awesome. Dr. Ben, thank you so much. I don't want to hold you. I think we got to get the lunch. Sounds great. People are hungry. <laughs> so thank you so much. I appreciate it. And hopefully we can catch up in six months. Anytime, Tiger. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Whoop, 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 whoop.